Revelation chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. Legacy Standard Bible. It's on your sheet there. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. And I looked. And behold, a black horse. And he who sits on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, One choinix of wheat for one denarius, and three choinix of barley for one denarius. And do not harm the oil and the wine. May God bless the reading of his word today. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is not a pleasant message to deliver about horses, especially black horses. I don't have to tell you about the rising cost of living in Canada in the last couple of years. So this is familiar territory to us Canadians. We're currently experiencing what's called inflation when the price of goods goes up faster than the wages that people earn. But in this uh, section of scripture, it's something that's beyond inflation. It's referring to hyper, hyperinflation. Hyperinflation is an economic term that means that the cost of living has gone up so quickly that the wages that people earn are not able to keep up with the cost of living. In this case, the white horse of Antichrist led to the red horse of war, which leads to this black horse of famine, famine. When war strikes, a lot of resources get placed into military expenditures. A lot of the working class gets shipped off to war as soldiers, and so food production goes down, and there becomes shortages of commodities for people. Commodities are the things people need to survive. And in the language of Revelation, we read there that one who sits on the horse had a pair of scales. Scales uh, speak of value or quantity, quantity. Uh, I remember as a child, uh, $80 or $100 would fill a shopping cart. A shopping cart was filled for $80 or $100 30 years ago. Now today, to fill that same cart, you need a lot more than $80 or $100. That's called inflation. But in this particular horse in Revelation 6, verse 5 and 6, he says, the living creature says, one choinix of wheat for one denarius. Now, wheat is a quality form of food in those days, staple of wheat. Wheat is the, the, the good type of wheat, and barley is the poor man's bread. Wheat makes the good, the rich man's bread. So one Choy makes of wheat for one denarius, and denarius was a day's wage, a day's wage. So in the days of this, what we call hyperinflation, or the context here is that during the Third World War, what we call the Battle of Armageddon and the Tribulation, hyperinflation will occur, causing the price of one meal to be an entire day's wage. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. So other than describing uh, famines that are, have raged uh, humanity historically and, and perhaps in parts of the world today, and perhaps in this coming tribulation, I'd like to bring us to a uh, perhaps little known portion of scripture in 2 Kings under the ministry of Elisha. Elisha being the successor of Elijah and someone who inherited, if you will, a bad national scene under a bad leadership of a bad king. So the type of bad king in the Old Testament is King Ahab. King Ahab, of course, married to Jezebel. And King Ahab's successor, uh, Jehoram, became king after him. So we'll go to 2 Kings today, and we'll look from chapter 2 to 7, 
and will survey these uh, times of famine, but in parallel or in contrast to that, we'll look at God's providential care of his people. Amen. And we, that's true today. Also important to note during this time, Christmas season, as that's what, what season we're in today, there's a big emphasis on giving, on giving, and people are looking for charity during this time of year. So we have to have a biblical worldview as to where our sustenance comes from. So, so perhaps today also is a timely reminder of God's abundant provision for his home. Amen? So let's first look at one verse in 1 Timothy 6, 8 in the context of this coming famine. And we'll say that in today's dispensation that what God requires of people during all ages is this, 1 Timothy 6, 8. And if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. 1 Timothy 6, 8. This is a separation of wants and needs, so we may want certain things, but needs are food and shelter. For instance, we need water, we need air, and we need food for our bodies, and we need covering or protection from uh, cold or protection from elements, protection from wild beasts. These are the basics that mankind needs. We know that um, it's not enough just to be fed spiritually, we also need physical food as well. So God wants us to learn to be content with basics, with the basics. That's principle number one. Principle number two, found in Philippians 4.19, is that God will provide for his own. God will provide for his own. So even in the context of this uh, famine, God will provide for his own as he has in the past and as he is today. Philippians 4.19 says, and my God will fulfill all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So this is not a, a universal promise for everyone to claim, but rather for those who are faithful, those who have faith in God, as we'll see in this, um, in this illustration from 2 Kings. A little bit of uh, background uh, from 2 Kings verse 3, as we introduce our wicked king who brought along a famine in the land. You remember on Judah's side, there was a more righteous king from the righteous branch of David. David was as a type or the father patriarch of good kings, if you will. In his order, you have good kings like Jehoshaphat, who's a, a contemporary of this king. And you have other good kings like Hezekiah, Uziel, and so on. Now, Jehoram, Je Jehoram, now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, now remember Ahab was a wicked king, became king over Israel and at Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. So Judah is the king of the north, and uh, uh, Jehoram is the king of the, of the south. And reigned, or pardon me, reverse, is the king of the north and the south. And reigned tw 12 years, and he did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, though not like his father and his mother. And he took away the sacred pillar of Baal, which his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel sin, and he did not turn away from them. So God had made covenant with Israel that if they walked in his ways, he would bless them. But if they turned from his ways, he would bring oppression from neighboring uh, rivals. Here's a quote that I found from a, um, a writer named Michael Hopp. And the literary work is called Those Who Remain. His quote here is telling. It says, quote, hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times, end quote. We'll look at uh, what this evil king or this uh, weak king did to his nation in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 24 and 31. 2 Kings chapter 6, uh, verse 24 to 31.
Now, it happened afterwards that Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, gathered all his military camp and went up and besieged Samaria. So, the king to the north of Israel from Syria, after Ahab died, he decided he would conquer Israel. So he brought about Ahab brought about invasion. Verse 25. So, verse 23 says, Now there was a great famine in Samaria. So, there was a famine, just like the one in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. And behold, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver. Now, if people are, are spending top silver for a donkey's head, you know things are bad. And a fourth of a cab of doves dung for five shekels of silver. So even bird droppings had gone up in price. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, so this is the evil king, he's looking at his nation in shambles, and he hears this from his pit populace. A woman cried out to him saying, save me, save my lord, O king. So she's crying out for salvation from her king, Verse 27, he said, If Yahweh does not save you, from where shall I save you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? And the king said to her, What is the matter with you? And she said, Now listen to the plight of the people under King Jehoram's day. This woman said to me, Give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and <clears throat> ate him. And I said to her on the next day, Give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. Now it happened that when the king heard the words of the woman, he tore his clothes. Now he was passing by on the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth, beneath his body. And he said, May God do to me, and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. Now this weak king, instead of taking responsibility for the plight of his people, he has the audacity to blame the man of God, the prophet, for the problems befalling him. He says that it's Elisha's fault that the city is being uh, besieged. But the man of God is still a representative of Yahweh, and Yahweh is for the children of Israel. So let's go there to 2 Kings chapter 2, and 19 to 22. And we're going to see God's miraculous provision. This is part of the age of miracles. We're going to see God's miraculous provision in times of famine. They're in 2 Kings chapter 2, 19 and 22. Then the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold now, the habitat of this city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. So apparently the water was poisoned. Verse 20, and he said, Bring me a new jar and put salt in it. So they brought it to him, 21, and he went out to the spring of water and threw salt in it and said, Thus says Yahweh, I have purified these waters. There shall not be from their death or barrenness any longer. So the waters have been purified to this day, according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. So this is going back to commodities. People have to know, once again, what the basics are. We have, such, we have a culture that reveres entertainment, that, you know, a lot of times uh, rich people are asked what they do for a living, and they say we are uh, influencers, which means they have a YouTube channel or they, they're popular on social media. So this is a culture that glamorizes entertainment and, and frivolous things and trivial things. We go to the Bible 
and we read of water. Water is a basic staple. Without clean water, we cannot sustain life. So if you have clean water today, give thanks to God, for he is good. Amen. Again, we're going to look at God's miraculous provision for his own there in 2 Kings uh, chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4, we'll go there. This was the, the uh, account of the, the Shunammite woman uh, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. Now from verse 4, we'll go from verse 4. Okay, well, chapter 4, sorry. 2 Kings chapter 4. Now a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. So one of the prophets is dead. Maybe he was killed by Jezebel, or maybe he, he died of famine. And you know that your servant feared Yahweh, and the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And we know that during hard times, people often go bankrupt or they sell that which is most precious to them. And in those days, they would sell their children. Verse 2, and Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? So Elisha is a man of God. He has pity and compassion. And he, he knows that this is a virtuous woman. Tell me, what, what, to, what do you have in the house? And she said, your servant woman has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. So this was her only means, if you will, her savings. Verse 3, then he said, go ask for vessels for yourself from those outside, from all your neighbors, and even empty vessels do not get a few. So this is reminiscent of how Jesus furnished uh, water into wine at the wedding in Cana. But this time, this widow has a little jar of oil. And Elisha says, go get some vessels not just if you get, get a lot of vessels. Verse 4, And you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour out into all these vessels, and you shall set aside what is full. So, when, so she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons, so they were bringing the vessels to her, and she poured. Now it happened that when the vessels were full, she said to her son, Bring me another vessel, and said to her, there is not one vessel more, and the oil stopped. So in this account, you have Elisha, a servant of God, miraculously multiplying this widow's oil and filling the jars. Now, oil is a um, valuable commodity in those days. It would, it would be more valuable than bread, because if you look in our, in our uh, Revelation 6, 5, and 6, 5 and 6, it says, do not harm the oil and the wine. That means that even during the Great Tribulation, certain luxuries will still hold their value. Some things hold their value during hyperinflation. Other things don't. And the, this commodity of oil holds its value during hyperinflation even. So we see God's uh, miraculous uh, provision. We're going to go see... As Elisha travels the land, the context here is it's not just the Shunammite woman who's a, a son of a wife, wife of a, a widow, I mean, a, the widow of a, a fellow prophet, but also the country, the people in the country, the ordinary farmers and peasants are also afflicted with this famine. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 38, as we uh, survey the landscape of this time of famine. And, I want us to glean some principles, a principle specifically hard work that can definitely help to persevere or to dig ourselves out, if you will, of this famine. We're going to go to uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 4 and 38, and then we'll look at uh, 2 Kings chapter 6. So this is another miracle. Uh, now Elisha returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in the land. As the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, he said to his young men, put on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. So he says, let's make a communal meal. It sounds like let's open a soup kitchen or let's open uh, 
a banquet hall that everybody can come in. Sounds a lot like what the church is supposed to do today to help uh, the poor. Verse 39, Then one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it wild gourds, filling his cloak, and came and sliced them into the pot of stew. And they did not know what they were. So they're just gathering anything edible. They put it in this pot, verse 40. So they poured it out for the men to eat. And it happened that as they were eating of the stew, they cried out and said, O oh, men of God, there is death in the pot. Perhaps the food was contaminated. Perhaps it had spoiled. He says there's death in the pot. And they were unable to eat. So the food was contaminated. Verse 41, but he said, now bring flour. He threw it in the pot and said, pour it out for the people that they may eat. Then there was no harm in the pot. So he preserved the food or he restored the food somehow. I would say uh, humbly that in, in our day and age, you can buy canned food and store up cans of food, and that food will preserve. You can freeze your food in the freezer. That's, I know that's what we do in our home. We buy in bulk, and we freeze it. And you can also preserve food with uh, salt or various spices. So uh, during times of famine, you have to also be resourceful. Resourceful, amen? Let's look at one more principle about uh, working hard and persevering through these uh, times of, of famine as well. We'll go to 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 1 and 7. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. I'll read it. This is the axe, the axe head floats. And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha. So these are the young men, what you would call the working class, if you will. Behold now the place before you where we are living is too limited for us. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? There's a, there's a housing shortage, if you will. There's not, enough, there's not enough houses. Two, please let us go to the Jordan. Each of us take from there a beam and let us make a place there for ourselves where we may live. So a, a good biblical principle is if the well runs dry... Don't keep trying to draw water from that dry well. Go and dig another well. Amen? Amen? Amen. And let us make a place there for ourselves where we may live. So he said to God, go. So the Lord uh, permitted this. Verse 3. Then one said, please be willing to go with your servants. So they want the prophet to go with them on this um, this. Um, uh, I guess you would say pilgrimage. And he answered and said, I shall go. So God, remember God goes before us and behind us. He's our vanguard and our rear guard. Amen? Verse 4. So he went with them and they came to the Jordan and cut down trees. So notice that they have to be industrious. You, you can't get out of a recession or a hyperinflation by folding your hands. You have, you have to somehow work the ground. You have, you have to find sustenance. Amen? The Bible says that the, the, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The hands of the diligent makes rich. Amen? Now it happened that as one was felling a beam, so picture this scene here. There's an axeman. He's got a, an axe, so he's got a wooden shaft with, with the head of the axe, which is made out of steel. The axe head fell into the water. So you can imagine his plight. It's his only tool. He needs it to cut down the tree so he can make a home for himself. And the axe head falls in the water. You say, well, that's not a big deal. He can go to Canadian Tire and get a new axe. No, not so much. Read, read on. It says, he cried out and said, alas, my master, for it was borrowed. This is a man who's working on credit. He, he doesn't have his own axe. This is an axe that was borrowed. We would say he's, he's maxed out all his credit cards. He can't buy another axe. He can't provide for himself. Look at this in verse 6. Then the man of God said, where did it fall? So picture a metal object in water. What does metal do in water? It sinks. 
And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick, the prophet cuts off a stick, and threw it in, in there and made the, the iron float. But brothers and sisters, this is a miracle. This speaks of God's miraculous provision to his own during times of famine. And he said, take it for yourself. So he sent forth his hand and took it. Isn't that something? We'll go, uh, we'll close with this in, uh, this is probably the, the biggest principle or lesson that, that we learned from this is that we have to have faith. We can't, we can't doubt God. We can't give up on God. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 32. Let's go there. This is the climactic scene in this account of Elisha, the Assyrians, rally a huge army and they're besieging they're besieging uh, Samaria all seems lost the people are famished and the king is unbelieving his officials are unbelieving and God says tomorrow there will be food sold at a discount at the gates of the city now this is what they will call prophecy Elisha makes a prediction that Tomorrow, there's going to be more than enough food for the whole city. And listen to this official's response as he doubts God. And see God's provision in spite of, you know, because the Bible says God is gracious to the, the wicked and he's gracious to the good alike. But how much more to have faith and believe that God is gracious and good. Amen. Go to 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 32. Now Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. And the king sent a man from his presence, but before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, Do you see how the son of a murderer has sent to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold the door shut against him. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? In other words, Elisha did not trust this official because he was of the same unbelieving type of his king. Verse 33. While he was still speaking with them, behold, the messenger, no, the messenger came down to him and said, Behold, this evil is from Yahweh. Why should I wait for Yahweh any longer? Hmm. Verse chapter 7. Then Elisha said, Listen to the word of Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh, About this time tomorrow... A sia of fine flour will be sold for a shekel, and two sias of barley for a shekel in the gates of Samaria. In other words, the hyperinflation is going to come to an end, and the food prices are going to be affordable yet again. Verse 2, brothers and sisters, if you have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit says. Verse 2. And the royal officer on whose hand the king was leaning answered the man of God and said, Behold, if Yahweh should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? He doubted. He was unbelieving. And this is the word of the prophet to that unbelieving officer. Then he said, Elisha said, Behold, you will see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat of it. You will see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat of it. Brothers and sisters, this officer is guilty of the sin of unbelief. Unbelief is a serious sin. And if we doubt God's providential care, for us today, brother and sister, we are committing the sin of unbelief, and we are guilty. But look at how this uh, tale ends. It's quite remarkable there in verse 3. Perhaps you've read it. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. So these are, these are um, outcasts of society. They're not allowed near the common folk. So they're outside of the city gate. And they said to one another, why do we sit here until we die? They got nothing to lose. If we say we will enter the city, then the famine is in the city. 
and we will die there. And if we sit here, we die also. So now come and let us go over to the camp of the the Arameans, the, like the northern Assyrians. If they spare us, we will live. And if they put us to death, we will die. In other words, let's go where we think there's food. And if they, if they spare us and give us food, we live. If they kill us, they kill us. We're going to die anyways. Verse 5. So they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Arameans. Arameans, pardon me. There, then they came to the outskirts of the camp of the Arameans. And behold, there was no one there. So they reach the camp of the enemy that's besieging the city, and everybody's gone. All the soldiers have turned away, and they left behind all their supply carts, all their, all their stock, all their food, all their equipment. Verse 6, now the Lord had caused the camp of the Arameans to hear a sound of chariots and a sound of horses, even the sound of a great military force. So we're back again to horses. The Bible says that the horse prepares for battle, but the Lord determines the outcome of the battle. So God is sovereign even in times of war. And God is no respecter of persons, and he does according to the counsel of his own will, even if that means turning away aggressors and miraculously providing for his own so that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. So God gave them a delusion, the sound of chariots and horses, and the Arameans thought that the Israelites had hired mercenaries to fight for them. So they fled. Verse 7 said, Therefore they arose and fled in the twilight and forsook their tents and their horses and their donkeys, even the camp, just as it is, was, and they fled for their life. So these lepers saw all the provisions, and they went back and they reported to the king of the plunder that could be theirs. And I'll fast forward a bit to verse 12. It says, Then the king arose in the night and said to his servants, I will tell you what the Arabians have done to us. They know that we are hungry, therefore they have gone from the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, when they come out of the city, we will capture them alive and get into the city. Now this wasn't true. This was the king's unbelief again. The king's unbelief again. So instead he sent to see. In verse 14, they took therefore two chariots with horses, and the king sent after the king of the camp of the Arabians, saying, go and see. Remember what the prophet said you will see to the officer. You will see it, but you will not enjoy it. Because it is a, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Verse 15. And they went after them to the Jordan, and behold, all the way was full of clothes and equipment, which the Armenians had thrown away in their haste. Then the messengers returned and told the king. So the people went out and plundered the camp of the Armenians. Then a sea of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel, according to the word of Yahweh. So what happened when all these goods flooded the market? The prices dropped. You can't sell a good when there's an abundance for a high price. People are going to say, I don't need to buy it for a high price. I buy it for cheaper. And that's what they did. They bought it for cheaper. Now, hear this, though. This is a warning to the unbelieving. Verse 17. Now the king's appointed royal officer... This was the naysayer who went to see the prophet and says, even if Yahweh can open a window from heaven, will he do it? In other words, is God a good God? Is God gracious? Will God provide? Hear what this man deserved. Prophet Elisha said, you will see it, but you will not enjoy it. Now, how is this fulfilled? Look at the dramatic end to this wretch there in verse 17. The royal officer on whose hand he leaned to have the charge of the gate. In other words, he was the one to open the gate and say, you may come in and you may go out. And brothers and sisters, if you've ever seen footage of refugees, when foreign aid arrives, they flock to that food and they just, it's a stampede. Everybody's going for the food and it's, you better get out of the way because you can get trampled in a stampede. And guess what happened to this naysayer? He thought he could restrain these hungry people. Nope. 
the royal officer on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate, but the people trampled on him at the gate, and he died just as the man of God had spoken, who spoke when the king came down to him. So it happened just as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two seas of barley for a shekel, and a sea of fine flour for a shekel will be sold tomorrow about this time at the gate of Samaria. And the royal officer had answered, the man of God had said, Now behold, if Yahweh should make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? And he said, Behold, you will see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat, it, eat of it. And so it happened to him, for the people trampled on him at the gate, and he died. So brothers and sisters, famine is real historically, biblically, and during the time of the tribulation. But for those of us who are believing, we believe not only that God is, Jesus Christ is our salvation in the eternal sense, he uh, purchased the redemption or the, the, the forgiveness of sin through his shed blood on the cross of Jesus Christ, but he's also provided for our temporal good. And God will provide. Amen. Jehovah Jireh, God is my provider. So I want to challenge everybody. Uh, maybe you're, maybe we're all victims right now of a, a bad economy in Canada. There's a recession. Some people are fearing even deeper depression and hyperinflation. We have to have faith that God will provide for us. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Father, I thank you for your promise that you will provide all our needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus. I pray for the church to be believing. I pray, Lord, that we not be a, have an unbelieving heart like that royal officer of uh, Jehoram, the, the son of wicked King Ahab. Help us, Lord, to be uh, more faithful and believing, following in the line of believing kings to have faith that God will deliver his people and that we should have faith and that we should believe that God is good and gracious and will in time pour out a blessing that we can't contain. He will in time bless the work of our hands and will in time restore us and our land. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.